This series has taken us through important concepts of biology, mutations, and mechanisms of evolution. In the last video, we ended with an explanation of the concept microevolution, which is genetic change below the level of species. In this, the last episode of the series, we will investigate the final, what I've called, step of evolution, macroevolution. Macroevolution is defined as genetic change at or above the level of species. But before we can get into examples, we need to understand the species concept. Understand that species are the only taxonomic categories that physically exist. Genera, families, orders, etc. are human constructs used to classify organisms. With the identification of so many organisms, both living and extinct, cladistics has become much more useful than taxonomy for categorizing organisms. In cladistics, rather than having all named categories, many organisms are in nameless groups. This makes it easier for systematists to classify organisms. So, let's look at these species concepts. Unfortunately, there are many, way too many to mention here. Some popular ones are the biological, anatomical, and ecological species concepts. The biological species concept says that a species is all organisms that can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. Of course, this can't possibly apply to asexual or extinct organisms. It does work, however, for a great many organisms. The anatomical species concept defines a population of organisms as a species according to their anatomy, which would be helpful for extinct organisms, but can cause problems when dealing with sexually dimorphic species. And, the ecological species concept defines a species as a set of organisms exploiting a single niche. Each of these concepts works to different degrees, but what biologists consider to be a single species requires a combination of reproductive abilities, anatomy, genetics, ecology, evolutionary history, etc. Subspecies are also often named and are populations of species that are somewhat genetically, morphologically, and or behaviorally different from other members of the species. Whether or not subspecies is a useful concept depends on the biologist, and I only use it here because of the traditional names of the organisms involved. Thus, once a species is defined, over time it will likely, if it does not go extinct, speciate. Speciation is the process by which new species arise. For animals, every parent that mates with another parent of the same species gives birth to the same species. If two equus equus mate, then an equus equus is produced. If members of two different species try to sexually reproduce, then they will likely not produce viable offspring if they produce offspring at all. The reason for this is called prezygotic and postzygotic barriers. These are things that prevent the birth of fertile offspring. For instance, a prezygotic barrier might be the genetic incompatibility between the egg of the mother and the sperm of the father, resulting in no birth. A postzygotic barrier might be the infertility of the offspring. Mules are the offspring of a male donkey and a female horse or a mare, but mules are sterile or unable to reproduce. I said previously that two parents of the same species will give birth to an offspring of the same species. Then how do new species arise? New species arise through genetic dissimilarities that accrue in populations over time. There are also numerous types of speciation, including allopatric and sympatric speciation. Allopatric speciation is when a species moves to a new area and becomes genetically and reproductively isolated from the parent population. Look at the Encetina salamanders in California. This is a genus of salamanders that has formed a ring around the California Central Valley, hence the name ring species. The species Encetina eschultzi has formed numerous subspecies around the valley extending northward into Washington. The ancestors of Incetina eschultzi eschultzi moved from the southern end up the, to the northern end of California and looped around the valley back to the starting point. However, so much time had passed that the E.E. E. Clarberry is now unable to breed with E.E. E. eschultzi. At the same time, Nearby subspecies are able to breed with each other, but not with distant subspecies. According to the biological species concept, these are two different species. The same thing has happened to the greenish warbler around the Himalayan mountains and the Caribbean slipper spurge around, of course, the Caribbean. Thus, ring species are good evidence of evolution. 
Sympatric speciation, on the other hand, is when a population doesn't diverge geographically, but speciation occurs anyway. An example of this is Arapaimas in the Amazon River. The paper, Genetic Diversity and Population Structure of the Threatened Giant Arapaima in Southwestern Guyana, Implications for Their Conservation, says, quote, Surprisingly, structure analysis of microsatellite markers grouped Arapaima from Guyana into three distinct clusters. One was again restricted to the Branco Basin, while the other two were sympatric at multiple sites in the Essequibo Basin. This is the first time genetically distinct groups of Arapaima have been found in sympatry at multiple sites, end quote. But speciation is not confined to the dark and distant past. There are numerous observable examples of it. Cichlids in the African lakes Victoria, Malawi, and Tanganyika speciate rapidly due to phenotypic plasticity in their jaws. That is, they can rapidly adapt their jaw types to specialize on different ecological niches. Cichlids can also show both allopatric and sympatric speciation depending on the amount of water that is available. The mosquito Culex pipiens separated into two distinct species because of World War II. In London, some people took to the underground railway tunnels for cover from German bombs, and they carried mosquitoes with them. Because of this, the population of C. pipiens underground speciated into C. molestus. Hybrids can even on occasion become new species if they can form a population of sexually reproducing individuals distinct from the parent populations. What all of this tells us is that speciation happens and, therefore, macroevolution happens. In my video, The Mathematics of Population Genetics, I showed that evolution is mathematically inevitable. First, mutations are inevitable due to the imperfection of DNA copying enzymes. Second, Mechanisms of evolution, like natural selection, are also inevitable. They are plain and simple results of the environment acting on genetics and morphology. With that known, it should also be clear that macroevolution is, therefore, inevitable, so long as the population can survive long enough. This has been an explanation of how evolution works. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.